Hello there. Uh, my name is Katherine Halter. I am a park ranger here at Kirchner Cavern State Park, and I work in the cave unit, which is essentially our natural resources department. Now we do uh, above ground projects and monitoring, but our main focus is the cave. Now one of my main projects, projects and focuses is lint here at the cave. Uh, so this includes lint removal and also lint removal events and projects that are open to the public. So this presentation today, I'm gonna talk you through uh, kind of the history of thinking about lint here at this specific cave, as well as the ways that we manage lint currently. And I'm going to end this by an appeal hopefully getting some assistance on how to shape and move our lint removal events going forward and into the future. So let's jump right in. Uh, many of you are already familiar with Kirchner Caverns, but if not, or you need a refresher, here's a map of where we are located. Uh, this is the southeastern corner of Arizona. We're about an hour's drive time away from Tucson. We're right here on the Highway 90, uh, which makes this area very accessible to visitors. A little history about Karchner Caverns. This cave was first found in 1974, which is very recent. Um, it was discovered by these two folks here, Randy Tufts and Gary Tennant. We do have about two and a half miles of passageway. Now there are a couple of different aspects that makes Karchner Caverns as a cave unique. And one of those is our mineralogy. Now, our mineralogy is, is very diverse. We have minerals from at least six different chemical classes, and we are listed as one of the world's top 10 caves when it comes to mineralogical diversity. Uh, we also have very densely decorated rooms. I'll show you a picture on the next slide of one of these rooms. And then we also host a maternity roost every summer of Myonis vellifer, which are the common cave bat. So every summer, half of our cave tour route closes down in order to protect that maternity roost. It's, a, it's pretty cool. Um, now this philosophy listed here is conservation through commercialization. Randy and Gary use that philosophy uh, moving forward in order to develop this place and it essentially made it the cave it is today. Now, like I said, they, they found it back in the 70s, but they kept it a secret for quite some time. They had seen caves mistreated and mishandled in their past, so they wanted to ensure that this cave did not meet that same fate. Um, and so they, they came across this philosophy, the conservation through commercialization, and that's really how they shaped their path going forward. Um, essentially what that means is that they're going to protect the cave by development. Um, so what took place were years and years of research and monitoring, um, not only this cave, but other caves as well, essentially seeking advice of what went wrong when you developed a cave or um, what mistakes were made or how can we improve upon the lessons that you learned. So of course, creating a tour in a cave is an impact, it's a very big impact, but we wanted to make that impact as small as possible. And so going through all of this in the 1990s was, was very beneficial because there were already plenty of examples of other caves out there that we were able to learn from and those caves really helped us out in order to minimize our impact. We also have years of data uh, from those pre-development times. We can use those data currently to compare, um, essentially seeing how the cave has changed in the past few decades. And we use those data to make natural resources decisions moving forward. Around 120,000 visitors uh, tour the cave every single year. So here's that picture. Uh, this is a picture located in our throne room, which is the finale on one of our tours. This big column right here is the only named, or the only officially named formation at Karchner. It is known as Kubicon, and it is Arizona's tallest column, which is pretty neat. Um, so as you can see, there are a lot of formations going on in this room, and um, this is just one room of the cave. Now here we have a cave map. Um, on the right side here, all of the color lines represent different trails, tunnels, and this dark green line actually represents the tram road, which is, of course, outside of the cave. Now, this entire area in your upper left-hand corner, 
That is what is known as the back section of the cave. The only people that visit the back section of the cave are employees and scientists. And we do that on a very infrequent basis. Um, usually we make an annual trip to the back section to collect data loggers and, and monitor things like that. Uh, but the front section of the cave is where our focus is for lint. Now you can see this turquoise color is the rotunda throne tour and the dark blue color is the big room tour. We have about 2,800 feet of walkway inside of the cave. Now once again, many of you may already be familiar with how lint impacts caves in general. I wanna run through it really quickly here. Um, first of all, when lint gets into a cave, it's not pretty. Right? It's not great to see inside of a cave if you can imagine all that stuff from your dryer spread out on a beautiful formation um, or something really interesting looking. It, it's just not great. It also stinks. It smells bad. Um, many of you, I, I'm sure, have participated in lint removal events in the past. And if you um, have ever smelled your wet, soggy bag of lint, it's not good. Um, so on the surface level, lint is ugly and it smells bad. Going beyond that though, it does have some more serious and detrimental effects inside of a cave. Uh, the first is that it introduces artificial food sources. So Karchner Caverns has many different unique invertebrate species that have their own ecosystem inside of the cave. And if visitors are dropping anything inside of a cave, including little tiny specks of lint, it introduces essentially junk food to them. And we want to be very careful about that impact. Now the next um, item I'll bring up is unnatural speleothem dissolution. So whenever lint lands on certain formations, um, it can actually start to eat away and dissolve that mineral, which of course is unnatural and we do not want that to happen. And finally, um, while lint is generally confined to the tour route, if that lint is not removed in a timely manner, the lint can travel by air currents off into places um, other than the tour route. Now this is, it makes it very difficult to remove, but it, it is a very um, serious problem here at Karchner because we don't go off trail very often. When we do go off trail, it is for reasons like maintenance or environmental monitoring station data collection. Um, and when we do go off trail, we follow very old trails. So the trails that Randy and Gary made um, and any trails that came after that from the development crew, those are the trails that we stick to. So most of our cave surface has never been walked on. If lint gets to those areas of the cave, it's impossible for us to reach it and remove it. Now we do have a few systems in place to, first of all, prevent lint from even getting into problem areas of the cave. So I want to talk about our curbs first. Now Karchner did not invent curbs. They came before us. Um, I would really recommend reading Jablonski's paper from 1992 or 93. Um, that paper it is really beneficial because it describes the ideal height for curbs and we used all of that information to develop our curbs. So they are 16 inches high and what they do is as a visitor is walking through the tour route, anything that they are shedding is essentially um, fenced in to the trail system. And then on a regular basis, we will go through and wash the trails. So all of the, the lint and skin and hair, all of that that's landing on the trail and being confined by the curbs, it all gets washed into our sump pump system, which then pumps the water out of the cave. So those curbs are incredibly beneficial in containing debris. The next thing we have is a misting system. Now this picture here um, is dark, but it's not of the tunnel. The misting system is essentially this PVC pipe that you see right here, and it's got mister heads located along it. Now this misting system, it does require maintenance. We do change the mister head, heads on a regular basis, and sometimes they'll act up and we'll have to change them more often or just go in and adjust them. So it, it does require maintenance, but it is worth it because this misting system provides us with a couple of benefits. First of all, um, as visitors walk through it, it's going to slightly dampen their clothes, which essentially makes their lint stick to them. Um, so that lint is going to be on the visitor for a longer duration. Um, as soon as they enter the cave, it's not gonna be falling off until later on. So it helps with that and, and shedding material. It also helps with our humidity export. So if you think about the climate in Arizona, 
incredibly dry. Uh, our humidity is usually very low here. And a visitor walks in from that into a 99% humid environment. Um, so essentially that person is acting like a sponge and soaking up all of that humidity and that humidity is leaving with the visitor as well. So we have a couple of different uh, systems in place to protect the humidity. Um, however, the misting system also has the added benefit of adding that humidity and wetting down the visitor so they don't steal it all away. Now, there are a couple of things that we do on a tour to manage the lint as well. First of all, our tour sizes are restricted. So the Rotunda Throne Tour only handles 20 visitors at a time, and the Big Room Tour only handles 15 visitors. Now, those numbers also help with, with different resource concerns, but one, things, one thing it does help with is lint impact. Less visitors, less lint. Um, next, interpretive guides also instruct visitors to secure any extra layers they may be carrying. Um, so our cave, once again, 99% humidity, it's also 71 degrees Fahrenheit about, uh, which makes the humidity makes it feel a lot hotter than 71 degrees. If you're coming in during the winter time, you usually have a lot of extra layers on you. As soon as you walk through that first tunnel door, you want those off. So because of that, we usually see an increase in lint during the winter time, but we also have the interpretive guides um, instruct visitors to carry things in a very specific way. So we ask them to do one of two things. The first is to take a jacket from the shoulders, roll it down into a tight rope, tight around their waist or their body. If they are uncomfortable with that, we ask them to fold it or um, pack it into a tight shape, kind of like a football, and then tuck it under their arm for the duration of the tour. Essentially, what that does is prevents any flapping material. That is going to flap and fly lint deeper into the cave. We want to prevent that. So just that extra step does help in managing our lint. Now I'd like to go over our lint camp logistics here. Now this lint camp is what I've developed in my time here. I started in the fall of 2018 and really took control of this in 2019. Now Karchner has had lint camps before then, of course, uh, but they were usually more of your typical lint camp that I've read about, multiple day events, um, things like that. So we, we have a sp pretty specific lint program that I'm going to go over here. However, I do want to mention this is pre-pandemic. Um, so we have not, our last link camp was in February and we have not hosted a link camp since then. I usually try and do one every quarter. However, that's been put on hold indefinitely. You know, I'm not sure when we're going to feel um, it is appropriate to host a, another lint removal event. And when it is appropriate, a lot of these logistics might end up changing. We might have to reduce our group size or keep in mind social distancing, that sort of thing. Um, so here are our logistics pre-pandemic as they stand. Um, so first of all, our lint removal events happen on one day. And that day is split into two shifts of about four hours each. So we have an AM and a PM shift with a break in between. Now each of these shifts is limited to 20 participants and we do have an age limit of 13 and older. Now we actually have this age limit through experience. Um, one of my first experiences with Lint Camps here uh, was a scout group. It was a private group that we hosted and the, the people involved were younger. Um, not that they behaved inappropriately or anything like that, but they had a really hard time focusing after about the first 45 minutes. You know, they're in this awesome place. They wanna look around and they wanna explore. They don't wanna focus on this very tedious, uh, concentrating task. And so that's why we impose that age limit. Now, like I mentioned, I try to have four events every year, about one every uh, three months, and people sign up directly through me. So we have, um, I, I get emails, I get phone calls. We actually have a Google form on our website that people can sign up through. Um, any event that is happening on park here before a link camp happens, we will usually have flyers or sign up sheets, that sort of thing. I've never had a problem filling up our 20 participant limit. I will say sometimes I've run into um, people signing up and then not showing up. Um, however, I try to send out a week before reminder and I've had people cancel and then those spots automatically get filled. Um, so like I said, I, I usually have not had a problem filling those slots. 
Now, we also host additional events that are still open to the public, but it's a private group. So for example, in 2019, we hosted a medical group from Tucson that was about 15 participants, so big enough to be their own event. And, and they came down and it was their own people, but it was still members of the public going through the same training and doing the same volunteer work that a, a normal Lent event would happen or take place. Um, so the next, we actually provide all of the gear, which I'll go over a little bit later. Uh, all of the training, our training is usually, we, we've whittled it down to about 15 to 20 minutes of training before we head up into the cave. We also provide a lunch in between the AM and PM shift and everyone is invited to the lunch, even if they're just doing one shift because they can sign up for one shift or both. But even if they're only doing one, they can still come for the lunch. Now, usually this lunch is pizza, right? Because it's the easiest thing for us to acquire the day of. And lastly, I don't usually advertise this, but we do offer them a free tour voucher at the end of their, their volunteer day. So as they're walking out the door, I like to hand them a voucher as a way for them to come back and experience the cave in an interpretive way. Um, because what we're doing, you know, is very focused and they don't get to have the same experience that the normal visitors are getting. Um, so it's kind of a cool incentive to offer. Um, but like I said, I usually don't advertise that as a way to get more people signed up. I do want to mention though, whenever I'm advertising and signing people up, I like to stress that this event is not for everyone. Um, it's either standing or kneeling or squatting for hours at a time, doing very tedious, very focused work. Um, so I try to stress that, you know, if, if that doesn't sound like a good idea or a good time for you, or if you've got physical limitations uh, that would not really uh, like you to be on your knees for that long, that sort of thing, you might want to rethink it or, or talk to me about another alternative. And lastly, we tend to focus on problem areas along the tour route. So a couple of days before a Lent event happens, uh, members of my team will go into the cave with the UV lights and point out a couple of problem areas along the trail that we see a lot of Lent in. Now, usually these areas are tour stops right? It's where people tend to linger. It's where the interpretive guide will stop and talk. So everyone is in the same place for a few minutes at a time. And those areas tend to have the largest buildup. So that's usually where we clean up, but other areas of the tour route have to get cleaned at, at times as well. Now, here are the simple tools that we use to clean lint. Uh, so first of all, of course, we have the miniature handheld UV flashlights. Now those take batteries, they're battery operated, and I have learned to take both spare flashlights and a lot of spare batteries into the cave with me uh, because they can dull really easily um, or they can just run out of batteries or, or give folks problems. We, we use all rechargeable batteries here. Um, so I, yeah, that's a lesson that I have learned <laughs> with those flashlights. Um, the other tools that you see here are brushes. So the paintbrush on the right, I, I tend to use those in larger areas um, that is not a very, like not a very rough surface. So things like the curbs, they're, they're textured and they're rough, but it's all uniform. Um, so things like the curb or maybe uh, areas of Karchner Chaotic, which is what we call our rock walls that were built up as the development team was building the tour route. The little Sido brush, this white brush down here, that is my favorite tool to use um, because it's, it's a lot more detailed and you can get into cracks and crevices and you use it for smaller areas. So some people prefer the larger paintbrush, but I definitely prefer the more detailed brush. Um, in addition to these materials here, uh, we also provide knee pads if people are interested in them because our trails tend to be wet and they're made out of concrete, so they're not the most comfortable to kneel on. We also provide uh, helmets and headlamps. And this is the last tool that I want to mention. However, this is not a tool that is used by volunteers. So this is our backpack vacuum. It's kind of like a Ghostbusters vacuum. Um, at the bottom here is where the exhaust comes out. So there is a HEPA filter in that exhaust. However, we use this vacuum solely for the curbs. And if you have it on and you lean over to vacuum a curb, that exhaust is just going to shoot out 
everywhere. And we don't want that to happen. We want the exhaust focused on the trail. So if anything comes out, we can wash it down later. Uh, so this is a tool that I use on my own work time and I'll wear knee pads, get on my knees and vacuum a section of curb before kind of shuffling down to the next section. So it is a tool that is used just not by volunteers. And here are some of our results. So in the year 2019, we did get to host four full events, 61 participants, over 187 volunteer hours, and over 20 grams of lint collected. Now, if you were looking at 20 grams of lint in a baggie, it's really not that much. However, in the scope of Karchner, where we don't have a big lint problem, um, it's huge. It is a big success. And I always try to stress to volunteers, do not expect to walk out of the cave with a pillowcase full of lint. That's not going to happen. But any little bit of lint that you are collecting and removing is lint that is no longer inside the cave and impacting the cave in all of those ways that we mentioned earlier. So every gram of lint um, is a success to us. So over 20 grams was great for 2019. Now our one event that we hosted in 2020, we had 17 folks sign up over 66 hours and that resulted in 5.7 grams of lint. Now a lot of those volunteers that came to the event last February were actually repeat volunteers that I had seen from 2019, which was really neat because they had kind of started to develop a rapport for, with each other. And in the AM shift, we had a lot of those repeat volunteers and I noticed in between themselves, they were having like a little competition to, to see who could collect the most lint, even though they did not know each other besides doing lint camp together. So it, it's kind of a cool community building event. Now we do have some conservation challenges to keep in mind while we are cleaning up lint. And the first is the delicate biology that we have inside of the cave. You know, as I mentioned, we do have a, a, a good ecosystem here with a lot of different invertebrate species. And those are pretty commonly seen when we're collecting lint. So it, it's not uncommon to see springtails or crickets or spiders, even scorpions if you're in the big room uh, while you're picking up lint. So I always make sure the volunteers are very aware of those and possibly what they look like um, and how to interact with them. Of course, you don't want to remove them or, or accidentally crush them. You just usually give them a little and they, they move along. Um, so I, I like to make sure that volunteers are very aware of, of that opportunity. Um, another thing to keep in mind, of course, is the delicate geology. You know, in some areas like the curb is not delicate. However, some formations and speleothems and even some of the chaotic rocks can be very delicate. So you want to just use extra care and caution while you're cleaning those areas. Another thing I wanted to mention that might be unique to Karchner, it, it might not be, um, is tour etiquette. Because while we are in there cleaning lint, there are still tours going on. Sometimes every 20 minutes there is a tour group. So this can prevent or this can present a, a challenge certainly, but it's also kind of a cool opportunity uh, because the interpretive guides, they do talk about lint on their tour. Uh, they talk about the curbing system and the misting system and all of that. So visitors are already aware of the lint problem as they're visiting the cave. However, it's really neat to see people working to remove that lint. And the, the guide, if they choose to do so, they can stop and interact with the volunteers or they can kind of use it as um, an interpretive opportunity, you know, to present and, and show what volunteers are, are helping us to do here. On our side though, it can present a little bit of a challenge um, just because we, we wanna be respectful of tours. So we don't wanna make a lot of noise and interrupt them. Um, we don't want to do anything, you know, if someone is standing on a curb to reach high areas, if a tour is passing through, you don't want to do that. Um, and of course, sometimes if you're in an area that is frequently visited or, or frequently used by visitors, you might have to actually physically get up and move yourself out of the way for visitors to make their way around you. And lastly, I wanted to mention, of course, white nose syndrome precautions. Um, so before visitors ever arrive here, or I should say volunteers ever arrive here to, to help us remove lint, they are aware of white nose syndrome. I, I do express it in the emails I, I send out, the, uh, the reminder emails as well. I basically tell them not to bring any of their own gear because we provide that and to try and wear clothes and shoes that have not been into caves or mines. Now we do have a product protocol here for visitors to disinfect their shoes, but not their clothes. So we ask those clothes to be left behind. 
In addition to that and all of those reminders, as part of our training, when the volunteers are actually here on site and we're going through all of the Lynch procedures, we actually go through white nose syndrome again. And we kind of talk about more why it's a problem, why it's something we need to keep in mind. And then we have them sign an affidavit, basically saying that they are acknowledging they don't have anything on their person that has been into another cave or mine. And that's also part of the reason why we provide all of the gear, such as the, the flashlights and the helmets and gloves and things. And finally, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, I would like to end this as an appeal for assistance. Um, you know, I, I've kind of developed our Lent camp here in order to include members of the public. We, ha we have a very strong community of conservation here at Karchner, and I, I, I really want to involve the public in that. However, I'm, I'm very curious as to how other caves out there do their Lent camps. I've heard of some caves that uh, do their Lent camps with local cavers and grottos. I've heard of Lent camps that aren't really lint camps because it's just the natural resources removing lint, but it's still lint removal, you know? So I'm, I'm very curious as to if you have an experience with lint removal or if you work at a tour cave that has a lint removal procedure, no matter what it is, I would love to hear about it. I have provided these questions here as kind of a guideline, but if you're willing to share your information with me, you don't have to answer all of these questions. You don't have to answer any of these questions. I am just, I'm very excited to learn more about other caves and about how other uh, lint removal things are, are taking place. So down there at the bottom, I have left my email. It's khalter at azstateparks.gov, as well as my work phone number. Now, of course, I, I, I want to mention that you know, I don't work seven days a week. Um, so if you call and you get a voicemail, please leave a voicemail. If you get another member of Cave Unit, they will happily pass your message along to me and I will get back to you. Um, yes, so if you are interested in participating in this, I would love to hear your feedback. And finally, that is all of my presentation. I would like to thank you all so much for uh, this opportunity. Um, I know that hosting an online convention is different than anything we've done in the past, but I, I very much appreciate this opportunity because physically I would not have been able to attend the convention. Um, so thank you all so much and take care.